Empire State Building. And what you see is an airship docking at the mooring station. There's a story behind that. The other one that has the airship, known as a dirigible, all right? Uh, we would call them a blimp today. In Germany, they were known as Zeppelins because uh, that was the name of the man and the company that designed them. That has been photoshopped. That is a fake. They were trying to use that image to actually sell the tower. But the Empire State Building is iconic, and it was, uh, it was built between 1930 and 1931. It opened on May 1st, 1931, 45 days ahead of schedule. And they had that mooring tower, which you see, uh, which is this part right here. And the reason for that mooring tower, which added an extra 200 feet to the amazing 1,050 foot tall building, or rather 102 story building of that time, because they wanted to maintain the Empire State's supremacy as the tallest building in New York, maybe even the tallest building in the world. That has since been eclipsed many times over uh, since then, but this was in the 1930s, 90 years ago. The idea was, was that uh, airships coming from Europe and Germany and England uh, with passengers, okay, uh, they would fly to New York and they would uh, confidently uh, come to the mooring station. People would be able to secure it after it's been secured. Then they would have this gang plate. Of course, it had little walls on the side that they could just step down and go into the actual station area. And then within about 10 minutes, taking the elevator down, they would be on the streets of New York talking about a confident entry into a city that's about as amazing as it gets. There's only one little problem. Uh, that was not a very feasible thing to do in terms of docking an airship. Why? Well, when you're up that high, and I have been, well, I don't know what they call it now, but I have been in Chicago up on top of the Sears Tower. This Sears Tower actually sways a little bit. It's absolutely amazing. I've uh, been to the, what was the Hancock Building. I think they're owned by different companies. They have different names now, but the two big, big buildings. Well, I can imagine the Empire State Building being the same. That high up, you get a lot of wind, gusty wind. It takes a lot of people to secure an airship uh, back in that day, and imagine one that big. Uh, you're not just going to throw a little line down, one or two people grab it, you know, secure it, it could yank them off the building. It was very impractical, very dangerous. But in September of 1931, a private and probably smaller airship, blimp if you want to call it that, did successfully dock for three minutes. It was commanded or piloted uh, by Lieutenant William McCracken, but he had to battle those strong headwinds of, of, of about 40 plus miles an hour. Down on the streets below, it tied up traffic. Of course, you got a lot of people driving. They're rubber decking, looking up like, what on earth? And others are, who are walking are stopping. So that's causing a, a, a traffic jam. Plus the police, in the event that that thing crashed, they're trying to make sure that there's nobody down below. So it proved to be uh, not a feasible thing. Well, I want to tell you tonight as we talk about access, and we do have study guides or listing guides, but I forgot to print them out. <laughs> My bad. Uh, but anyway, I have them, but, uh, but I don't have them in here. But anyway, um, as we talk about access, I'm here to tell you tonight that your access, our access to God the Father is never iffy. It's never infeasible. It's never impractical. And it's never impossible. You and I, can confidently approach God and have access to Him because of a relationship by grace through faith with Jesus Christ, who is God the Son. So our entry and our exit, all of that is an access that He provides. And we can be supremely, completely confident in Him. There is no spiritual headwinds gusting that would interfere or affect our access. 
So the last time uh, that we were here, uh, the last couple of Wednesday nights that we've been here, I'm just going to quickly uh, go over it. We have what I call a consecrated access. Jesus made the way, and it is His way or no way. It is the only way, and He has made that way through the sacrifice that He gave on the cross by shedding His blood for your sin and my sin and by, by rising from the dead. And therefore, you and I, because of that, can have that consecrated access to God the Father. Then last Wednesday night, we talked about complete access. Jesus has removed every barrier to give us access. God the Holy Spirit, one God, three separate persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit indwells you. That means He supernaturally lives within you when you put your faith in Jesus Christ. And He applies then what we need that God has granted to us so that we can come to Him. Tonight we're going to be talking about that confident access. If you have your Bibles... And no, I'm not checking my messages. But if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. And I'm going to begin reading at verse 12. But this man, that is Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. From that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool, for by one offering He has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us. For after He had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. Then He adds, Their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which He consecrated for us through the veil that is His flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. May God bless the reading of His Word as we talk about competent access. That is, we, young, old, makes no difference, we can enter into the very presence of God because Jesus Christ has given us that access. And we don't come cringing before God waiting for, oh, is He going to zap me? No, we don't come cocky before God like, yo, I got this, you know, what's up? You know what I mean? No, you, you come respectfully, you come humbly, but you can also come boldly. There is a confidence there, but it's a confidence that is granted you and me because of who Jesus is and what Jesus did on the cross, what Jesus did through the empty tomb. We can't approach. The door is open. And you and I are invited to come in. And we are expected to do so. Every day that you have an opportunity to have what I call a quiet time. Maybe it's your personal prayer time or a Bible time. I don't know what you call it, but back in my day, we called it quiet time. Okay? Um, even if for some of it may just be 10 minutes, but that's an opportunity. Because you, if you are saved, if you know Christ as Lord and Savior... You have an audience with the God of the universe. You have, you have an audience with the King of Kings. And you can approach anytime. Take advantage of it. Sometimes we don't do that nearly like we should. By faith in Christ, we have become sons and daughters, the children of God by grace. That means you and I have a royal 
right of access. You know, if you try to go to, I think it's uh, Windsor Castle or Buckingham Palace, other than as a tourist, a few times that you can go in, uh, if you try to just bebop up in there and, and say, hey, I, I want to check out where King Charles III, uh, you know, lives, chances are you're going to be escorted away, or you may be given a warning. If you try to get up in there and get past the guards, you're going to be arrested, you're going to be escorted away, and you're never going to be heard from again. I promise you that, okay? Or either you'll be, your face will be on the London tabloids as another uh, crazy person trying to, to break in and do something uh, at Winston Castle. You have no right... And you have no royal access, but members of, well, maybe not every member of the royal family, but most members of the royal family have a right to come to see the king because, well, they are related by blood or by marriage or by both. You and I have a royal right because of the blood of Jesus Christ to come boldly. We find those passages uh, in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 12, as we are reminded that we can boldly approach as we think about that. In the Old Testament, the image that you see on the screens behind me, you had in the temple, which was the house of worship, you had this veil, huge curtain, specially made, specially designed, and it separated the holy place, which would have had, as you can see, the menorah, that's the lampstand, uh, the golden altar of incense, where they were constantly burning, not sacrifices as far as animals, but incense, that is the sweet-smelling stuff, uh, representing the prayers and the praises of the people of God. You have, although you don't really see it as clearly, uh, what is known as the table of the showbread. It's where the unleavened uh, bread one for each of the twelve tribes, sat on a special golden table. It was put there fresh each new week. Uh, it would stay there before God. After that time had passed, a new one would come out. Uh, the priests were allowed to eat that. That was part of the offering that they were allowed to eat. But this is not a time for me to, to discuss all of what went on in the temple or in the, in the tabernacle. The tabernacle all is is a worship tent. The temple is a building. That's the only real big difference. There's some other style differences, but that's a uh, message for another time. Now, with that said, behind that curtain was where the Ark of the Covenant, as you see an image there, the Ark of the Covenant, uh, courtesy of Indiana Jones, no, not really. Um, but anyway, uh, Ark of the Covenant sat behind the curtain. Inside the Ark of the Covenant was the Ten Commandments, the, uh, the, the tablets of stone that God would have engraved with his finger. One of the older uh, Bible back books, uh, passages, uh, talks that the, uh, there was a pot of manna that had not uh, ever decayed, that it was in there. Also, Aaron's rod uh, that had uh, blossomed and bloomed uh, onions. Onions, almonds, excuse me, I knew I was going to mess that up, uh, almonds. Uh, but specifically, the, the Ten Commandments themselves. But in that area, and of course, where the two bird living things, those are known as cherubim. Those are special angels. They're called the angels of the presence. Symbolizing that in that mercy seat, that is where God communicated with the high priest. From, uh, from Aaron, the first high priest, all the way down. Now, you didn't just walk into the, into the most holy place. It's known as the holy of holies in the King James. In other translations, it's the most holy place. No, uh, only once a year could the, the high priest, wearing a special uniform, uh, a robe with a special vest plate and helmet, well, actually a, more like a hat, not a helmet, uh, would come in only once a year, uh, making a sacrifice, uh, sprinkling blood on that mercy seat uh, for himself, for his family, and for the people of Israel. Only once a year. If you tried to come behind that curtain before then, uh, it would mean death for the priest or whoever uh, attempted to do that. Even while he was inside, he could not stop. He could never sit down. He had to constantly keep moving. And his uniform had special bells sewn to the tassel so they could hear him. Because you, if something happened and he fell dead, you don't just walk in there to rescue him. You, you, he would have had a special uh, rope tied around him and they would have pulled him out. As long as you heard the bells, you, he was fine. You didn't hear it for a while, you better start pulling because you don't want the, the Holy of Holies to, to be profane. So it was a, a hugely serious business. It was almost as if 
Because, I mean, God wanted to be present with His people, but there had to be separation because of sin. It's almost as if God would be saying, and I, and I, I paraphrase this very loosely, okay? It's like, get out! Get out, or I'll kill you. Get out. That would have been the intention because of sin. But then one day, Jesus, who is the ultimate and great high priest, who shed his righteous blood on, on the cross, who rose from the dead, in that moment, that sacrifice has been accepted. And it says in the New Testament that the, that the veil of the temple was ripped from the very top to the bottom, something that would have been humanly impossible to have done. Well, he said, well, they could have climbed up and put a knife and wrote it down like pirates of the Caribbean. Well, yeah, but somebody would have seen them do that, and that would not have gone down well with the temple guard. Okay, A human impossibility. And yet, in the moment that Christ died, that veil was ripped, symbolizing access to God. Confident, consecrated, complete access to God. It was as if now God says, Hello. Y'all come on in. Come on in. Welcome. Welcome. Have a seat. Have a seat. Welcome. Sit down. Tell me all about it. I, I want to hear everything that you have to say. I'm, I'm supremely interested. Coffee? Anybody? Tea? Chocolate chip cookie? Crumpets? Anybody? He said, what made the difference? The blood of Jesus Christ. So tonight as we wrap this up before I start preaching, you can't approach. You are greatly loved and desired to approach God. But you have to know Him as your Heavenly Father through a personal love relationship with Jesus Christ. Do you and will you confidently approach Him tonight? Will you confidently approach Him each day? You can approach and access Him even now when you pray, when you study His Word, when you're acting on His Word, when you're gathering in worship service. Maybe some of you need to approach Him in a fresh new way again. You've kind of gotten stale with it. How long has it been for some of you? Let Christ, who is already your access to God, give you and be your confident, confident access. As we stand and sing our, our hymn of invitation, as our worship leaders come and lead us, I invite you to come. And, and maybe you need to uh, ask Jesus to give you that access for the very first time. You need to ask Him to be your Lord and Savior. Let's nail it down tonight. Maybe some of you need to come and pray because you haven't been accessing it enough. And, and the Lord says, hey, I, I want to spend some time with you. You're welcome. Come on. Will you give Him that time? Because you have that confident access in him. You come as God leads you to come. I